Welcome everyone, this is Andres Restart, and today we're talking about this interview that's been coming out from Nintendo about The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. It's this official Asset Developer series, they're on Volume 9, this is about Tears of the Kingdom, and Parts 1 and 2 have already come out, Part 3 is coming out tomorrow. And there's some serious new details here that I think are pretty exciting about Tears of the Kingdom that are revealed in this interview. So we're going to be reading through this together and interpreting some of the different things that are said. But before we jump into things, let me point out that we are aiming to hit 25,000 subscribers by the time Tears of the Kingdom comes out on May 12th. So if you do enjoy my content, please subscribe to the notification bell, because then we might just make it. And if by the time you're seeing this we have somehow made past that mark, join anyways, because we are growing further and further and we will be continuing to talk about Nintendo and The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. So I'll be linking parts 1 and 2 in the description below, I'm going to be skipping the introductions here and just get right into the thick of things. Thank you very much, many may already be familiar, but Anuma-san, could you give us a brief introduction to the Legend of Zelda series? Anuma, of course! The Legend of Zelda series is set in the Kingdom of Hyrule, where the sacred power of goddesses resides. It is a series featuring both action and puzzle solving, in which the protagonist Link, the player's avatar, battles against Ganondorf and others who are scheming to obtain that power. In many games, Link must also help Princess Zelda who is destined to be endowed with the sacred power of goddesses. This title, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, is a direct sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which released in 2017. Once again, it takes place in the vast land of Hyrule after the conclusion of the previous game. So what I find interesting about this introduction to the entire Zelda series here is that he is talking about the power of the goddesses. That seems to be something important to note and obviously also brings up Ganondorf which is the main antagonist for the series and he's returning in Tears of the Kingdom. So perhaps there will be this story of the Sacred Realm, the Triforce pieces because that all comes from the goddesses. So this title picks up after the events of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Anuma, yes. This title is set in Hyrule shortly after the end of the previous game. There are many reasons why we chose this setting. After finishing development on the previous title, we wondered if we could make it possible for players to continue exploring the world after they've reached the game's ending. I think this goes back to what we heard initially, that they had a lot of DLC ideas for Breath of the Wild, and a lot of that evolved into Tears of the Kingdom. They were probably thinking about a number of changes they could do in Breath of the Wild, I remember when Breath of the Wild came out, we were talking about, oh, they could do an expanded Hateno quest. They could add a whole other adventure. There could be more boss fights, things like that. And they gave us what we got with the Champion's Ballad. But seeing what we've gone with Tears of the Kingdom, they've clearly expanded in various directions. The Legend of Zelda series seems to be one of those franchises where the visual style and game mechanics often change drastically for each entry. Was there ever a discussion about creating a new game with a completely new world rather than a sequel? Anuma, no, not really. All of the previous title, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, had its own conclusion. We started to come up with new ideas that we wanted to bring to life in this already realized version of Hyrule. So our direction of making a sequel did not change. Fujibayashi, just like somewhere you know inside and out, we understand where everything is in Hyrule from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and because of that we believed it was possible to create new gameplay. For this reason, in the initial proposal, we clearly stated the setting will not change as an important concept. Even when I shared with this with the team members here, there were no objections and we were all aligned on the idea from that point onward. Dota When I was working the programming for Woohoo Island during Wii Sports Resort's development, I remember Miyamoto-san saying that he wanted to turn the actual stages of games into characters. What he meant by that was to create one island and use it as a basis to add various kinds of gameplay in different games. The idea of having new discoveries in the same setting was striking to me. I had been wanting to try this idea with other titles and I supposed this game would leverage that kind of approach. So what's interesting about this is that clearly that they wanted to stay in Hyrule of this form of Breath of the Wild, they wanted to follow up Breath of the Wild here. but they were more focused on this idea of changing the world and advancing it. So basically it seems like they were in love with the world of Breath of the Wild and they had so many different things they accomplished with it, but there was so much more that they saw that they could do. And they've always had this concept of, okay, so this was accomplished in this world, but what happens if we expand on that? 
And as someone who's been playing games for years, there are games that I enjoyed as a kid. I was like, whoa, well, what if we could go beyond this point? What if we could do this? And how would that change the game? For example, Mario 64. When I played Mario 64, I would see things in the background and I wondered, could I ever go there at some point? Is there a way to do that? Or the crazy mysteries of, oh, is Yoshi playable? And he wasn't, but I wondered, how would the game be if they made Yoshi playable? How would it change the experience they already had? And it feels like kind of like that kind of thought process went into Tears of the Kingdom. They've taken Breath of the Wild as a base and they've changed it in a lot of different ways that are going to make it really exciting for us. It's not about the game feeling stale, but rather more refreshing, but set in a setting that we've already come to love and understand. I see. So the decision to create a sequel in the, in the same setting was deliberate. Dota. In contrast, we made some fairly big changes to the gameplay. In The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, if players wanted to travel from the sky to the ground, they had to select it from the map. But in this game, you can dive from the sky directly to the ground without any interruption. On top of that, players can also ride on flying vehicles and so on, offering even more freedom within the same setting as the previous game. If a location were completely unfamiliar to you, you'd probably be hesitant to dive down from the sky. But because it's a world that you've already explored in the previous game, these transportation methods make sense. So that's very interesting. Because it's a world we already understand, they felt more comfortable with giving us these different ways to explore the world and progress quite quickly. Thinking about it, skydiving down. So we're going to see these varying points of interest. We're going to see areas where we wonder, huh, that's changed. Let's find out what happened and then we just jump straight down. Or how, like, for example, we have Ascend now. So when we're trying to climb something, perhaps with Ascend, we can find a way to get up quicker and be like, oh, what's up there this time? Has that changed? And as I noted, we can now fly across the world of Hyrule, so we can traverse a lot more quickly and find a lot more. So I'll say with that in mind, I think that strongly suggests that there is a lot more in this world because we can traverse it so much more quickly. Being able to dive from the sky to surface and into a pond seamlessly in this tile sure does feel exhilarating. It truly feels like an open air game this time around. Dota, adding the ability to dive from the sky was also partly due to Anuma-san and Fujibayashi-san's persistence, right? Fujibayashi, yeah. I've wanted to make this happen ever since The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Thinking about how satisfying it'd be to dive from the sky and jump directly into the water? In this title, diving is not just about enjoying an exhilarating seamless means of travel, but it also brings more value as a tool for gathering information about the surface by surveying it from above. This part, that's exciting to me. Because in Breath of the Wild, it was all about finding high points to explore, look around, and find where you're going to go next. So climbing one of these Sheikah Towers, that would be a little bit of a challenge. But then from that tower, you could jump off in a direction of a point of interest and use your paraglider to go in that direction. Or climb a mountain and do the same thing. But in Tears of the Kingdom, you're doing this from far higher, way above the mountains in the Sky Islands. So you're going to be able to see a lot more, and as we just discussed how there's a lot more traversal methods, you can progress through the world more quickly, but there's also a lot more to find in this game. So you're saying that being able to look over Hyrule from above and descend from the sky further expands the scope of the gameplay, right? Anuma. That's right. When we talk about these things, many may think, well, you can't enjoy this game unless you've already played the previous game and are familiar with the setting. But the new gameplay ideas we packed in this title are all things that can be solved intuitively. So I think first time players can rest assured that this game is easy to get into. Fujibayashi. The same goes for the story too. We put in some effort to make sure that it feels comfortable for both first time players and those with experience of the previous game. For example, we've prepared a character profile feature that players can see anytime during their adventure. So it's easy to understand the relationship between characters even without knowledge from the previous title. On the other hand, those who played the previous game may enjoy reading these profiles, because some of the content will make you grin and think, right, I remember that. So this is new information here. We didn't know that there will be character profiles last I checked, and that could be pretty cool because one, we could read bios on the different characters we meet, but it also kind of seems like something we might see in an RPG where there's a lot of side quests and you can see how different characters are related to each other. So this might bode well for more extensive side questing throughout Tears of the Kingdom. And they also talk about how the way they put this game together, it's not just about 
returning players with first time players too. They are keeping those in mind. So this game has been made approachable for more people. Since this is a sequel, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is the foundation, but I see there are also various considerations for new players as well. By the way, if you're using the same world, don't you need to put effort into creating differences in the graphics and sound? Takizawa I keenly felt that implementing something new into the same world was actually harder than creating something from scratch. Although it is the same world, we want to make sure players experience it with a new sense of wonder. So to achieve that, we had to take the world originally made up of things we designed to fit it perfectly, and then bolt a new layer of surprises on top of it, designed from a different perspective. And we had to do so without erasing the familiar world, even though we racked our brains last time to put it all together. Of course, from the development staff's point of view, it's definitely more fun to come up with ideas for crafting new surprises, but it sure was a challenging development process. Wakai, for the game's music, we broke the conventions of the series in the previous game and mainly used piano tones. While this title follows the same musical direction, we grapple with how to create a sense of freshness as a sequel. The sound effects are generated by a completely new system that's different from the previous game. So even if the same sound is used, it sounds a lot more realistic in this game. For example, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, we tried to make nearby environmental sounds such as bird calls sound realistic. However, with this title, the expressiveness of these sounds has improved to the point where players hear a bird call from afar and sense the distance more realistically. So here Wakai is telling us that the sounds have been improved upon and they're going to sound more realistic, which is interesting because I felt Breath of the Wild already had incredible sound effects. It really set up the ambience in the world and the immersion, the believability, and this sounds like they're taking that to an even greater level, which again is exciting. And Takizawa talked about how they wanted to make sure there was still that same sense of wonder that we got over Breath of the Wild when we first played the game. So for those concerned that we're going to play Tears of the Kingdom that's going to feel stale or just like a DLC, when they made the conscious decision to make this game the same world, they were keenly aware of that. And their efforts throughout this game was to make it feel fresh and new while still retaining what it was. So I think that does bode quite well for when we play the game. I don't expect it to feel too samey. Part 2, Linking Hands. Now let's move on to the things that have changed from the previous game. Speaking of which, I immediately noticed that Link looks a little different in this title, doesn't he? Aonuma, yes, his right arm. We wanted an iconic feature that would make it obvious at first glance that it's Link from this game. Speaking of Link's arm, Hand is a major theme in the title. Hands? Can you elaborate on this? Fujibayashi. Titles in the Legend of Zelda series intertwine all the elements of gameplay mechanics and story and combine them all into a single game. For this title, we chose Hands as the key theme to bring them all together. For example, abilities that Link uses to solve puzzles are all released from his hand and arm. We even included this symbolically in the game's mechanics such as having scenes that use hands when opening special doors. This hands theme also props up here and there as a key element as the story develops. I'll just cut in here and say, it's interesting that they're talking more and more about story. It sounds like they're paying closer attention to the story here, which I appreciate. Dota. Their previous game was a relatively lonesome game, or rather an endurance game where you made full use of Link's body and strength alone to traverse the vast world. What's unique this time is joining hands and cooperating with various characters and at times creating items with Link's own hands and utilizing them as you progress. I'll cut in again here. We've seen evidence of Link working with different AI characters like Sidon and Tulin for what appear to be dungeon areas or the lead up to dungeons and they are a lot more involved than what we saw in Breath of the Wild, but we also see Link fighting alongside different Hylians in actual battle. So it seems like they've really worked on the AI and they are creating a lot of new, unique interactions that we've never seen before in a Zelda game and that's really exciting. Takizawa, we were intentional in making this hand theme show through in the visuals as well as in the story direction. If you watch the trailers that we've released so far, I think you'll be able to get a sense of this atmosphere. Wakai, we also expressed the hand theme by implementing hand claps and, and such in the game's music. I have noticed. Aonuma, we'll simply put, hand expresses the idea of connecting. This applies to the story too, which connects to Hyrule's past. It also talks about a major struggle 
called the Imprisoning War, which until now was considered a myth even in Hyrule. So here they're mentioning the Imprisoning War, which is an event that takes place in the downfall timeline for The Legend of Zelda. Could this potentially be hinting at the timeline being in the downfall timeline? Possibly, but I think it should also be noted that there are elements from the era of Twilight in Breath of the Wild, and also there are the Koroks and the Rito that are from the Wind Waker, each taking place in different parts of the timeline. So, I wouldn't say it's a straight-up confirmation, but it's interesting that the Imprisoning War is a part of Tears of the Kingdom's history, and by extension, also Breath of the Wild. Fujibayashi, and the protagonist's name is Link, after all. Onuma, oh, I just got that connection. Everyone laughs. Onuma, it's funny how these things work out, isn't it? You don't notice these things when you're developing the game, but then after you're done, you see that all sorts of things were actually connected, and you realize, oh, so that's what we were doing, you know? As someone who's worked on various artistic projects, be it YouTube videos, or acting in different scenes and short films, or creating paintings and drawings, I'll say that working on different projects like this, there are things that happen that I appreciate, there are happy moments, but they weren't necessarily expected, or perhaps they were, I wasn't as aware of how it all came together in the moment, but once everything was said and done, I was like, oh, that came together quite nicely. I do kind of agree that there is something fascinating about how some things sort of connect sometimes. Moving on. So there are certain fundamental things that you wouldn't change because it's a sequel, and it becomes a matter of creating something new within those existing boundaries. It all sounds pretty challenging. Anuma, we set those boundaries ourselves, but new gameplay elements are born when we break through them. So we were breaking boundaries. Takizawa, breaking boundaries. That's a good phrase, Anuma. Turns out that a lot of the boundaries were pretty durable. Everyone laughs. Takizawa, on the other hand, the sound maintained just the right number of similarities with the previous titles so that it feels like an adventure in the same world. Wakai, exactly. We intend to keep iconic sounds from the previous title, such as the sounds that play when you obtain an item or solve a puzzle. Aonuma, breaking boundaries doesn't mean you can just destroy whatever you like, though. Those boundaries give you the base to feel safe about taking risks elsewhere. And that's interesting, because I, I understand that. It's finding a way to come up with solutions that lead you down a particular path. If you have no boundaries, I feel like your own preconceived biases are more likely to take you in a particular direction, but when certain boundaries are set, you're sort of forced to get creative and think about what you can do within those boundaries, and then sometimes you find a way to surpass them. And I've also noticed in the preview footage that there are some key sounds that remind me of Breath of the Wild, but it still feels very new at the same time, which is a very interesting balance that they've clearly been working over half a decade to strike, and from what we've seen so far at least, I think it's quite promising. No matter how everything else changes, when you hear those sounds, you'll think, oh, that's a Legend of Zelda game, right? Anuma, that reminds me of how the word deja vu cropped up many times during development. We were supposed to be making something different, but the various things we made gave off a similar impression to what we've done previously. But as development went on, we'd look at this, the game as a whole and sometimes discover that those things suddenly took a different shape because of the new elements we've added. Until then, we were anxiously trying to change things up, but at some point we realized that some of them were already as they should be. So, when I hear that, I think something along the lines of, for example, because there are certain mountainous structures in Breath of the Wild, they're probably also going to be there in Tears of the Kingdom unless they destroy it or change it in some way. And perhaps the Zelda team, as they seem to be alluding to here, would be worried about it failing to say me, but because of the new mechanics they've thrown in, the way you go about exploring them or the vantage points you see them from are so different that it still feels like a fresh new experience, but with an air of familiarity, which kind of just supports what we've been talking about throughout this interview. So there was one approach to make changes to remove that deja vu feeling, and there was another to keep things the same because that's the way they should be. Was everyone on the development team on the same page from early on about those two approaches? Fujibayashi, not in the slightest. There were many instances even later on in the development where we struggled to differentiate the two. 
It was a constant and difficult process where we and the development team continued to mull over and discuss until we all came to an agreement. Takizawa. We often experienced strong deja vu, particularly in the early stages, and we thought it was imperative to transform how the game felt as much as we could. We worked hard with that thought in mind, but once we got to a certain point in development, we were able to identify areas that would lose their appeal if we changed them. Fujibayashi. We started to think positively by calling what we decided not to change the great mundanity. Takizawa. By the end, the definition of this great mundanity became clear. So even if a team member approached us about a deja vu feeling, we felt more comfortable asking him to intentionally keep something unchanged. I think this entire interaction just expresses how challenging it was to maintain this balance of familiarity while also providing a new experience. I suppose it's like when a sense of values that isn't shared by everyone eventually clicks into place through trial and error. Aonuma, video game development is always like that. When various pieces come together and things start clicking into place, there's a moment when this is fine becomes this is it. And with that, I'll say that it kind of goes back to the whole making art thing where there's certain things you've been working on putting together and you're looking at it and you're like, oh, okay, I guess that's fine. But as you build around it and the pieces start coming together, it starts to take on a new meaning because of what it represents for everything else. So thinking that in the context of Tears of the Kingdom, they created these new abilities and they created some changes to the world, but not all of it. But putting it together as everything was pieced in, they were like, oh, this is a nice balance. Now, what that will mean when we actually play Tears of the Kingdom we're going to find out in a few days, but again, I think this all bodes really well and just helps to build my excitement for what's to come. So that's the interview so far. Part three will be coming out tomorrow. We will be talking about it tomorrow, so stay tuned. But that's all for now, everyone. Thank you all so much for listening and watching. This is Andres Restart. And again, I'll see you all really soon. Take care. Bye.